This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope you're well. You know, listeners often ask how they can help us create more stories, which is really great. The Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio. And you can support this vital work by checking out our show notes. And you'll find a link there about contributing small monthly amounts to my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Become a part of the wild community and help fuel the next adventure. Thank you. Enjoy the episode. When you put your head underwater on a coral reef, it is just an absolutely dizzying array of shapes and colours and noises and sounds. It's completely overwhelming. Coral reefs, to me, are the most beautiful and most valuable ecosystems we have on this planet. Um, they're the people refer to them as the rainforests of the sea uh, because they are so fantastically diverse and full of different forms of. Um, animals and plants. Dr. Tim Lamont is a marine biologist at Lancaster University in England. He spent most of his childhood in East Africa, and the first time he swam in a reef was off the coast of Kenya. And I still remember that sense of swimming around and, and seeing some things that I knew what they were and all sorts of things that I'd never seen before, I had no idea what they were. And it, it, it really did feel, and, and there are times when it still feels like you could swim around the corner and come across anything. To most of us, coral reefs conjure up magical places full of colourful species and life. But they're also unknown and otherworldly. Humans don't belong there. Scuba tanks and breathing apparatus seem a bit clunky and out of place. And you get this real sense of being a visitor in this ecosystem and this real sense of um, powerlessness almost. You know, everything around you on the reef is swimming around so effortlessly and elegantly and beautifully and it looks naturally in its place and you feel like this sort of ungainly, unwieldy being that's, you know, <laughs> Spot the odd one out. around this ecosystem, <laughs> and, you know, not, not sure what you're looking at, not sure how long you're going to be able to stay there and, you know, spluttering for air or you know, carrying all your equipment. Their beauty is perhaps a reason why coral reefs have become one of the more famous victims of climate change, warming oceans. Most people have heard that the future for coral reefs is in total jeopardy. And this is a problem, because about 25% of the ocean's fish depend on healthy coral reefs. Scientists are now warning that the Great Barrier Reef could be gone by the year 2050 if nothing is done to help it. This is where Tim Lamont comes in. He's a coral reef researcher, and his approach is a little different to the norm. He's interested in more than just what he can see when he's under the waves. He wants to know what he can hear as well. And it turns out, reefs are noisy places. Fish, shrimp, all the little creatures that call a reef home add to the sonic palate of the place. But as reefs become more unhealthy, life on them is becoming harder for Tim to hear. One of the um, the things we discovered when the reefs were degrading um, was, was that they were going quieter. That the sort of you know this biological symphony was being silenced. As a knock-on effect of that, it was becoming less attractive to the next generation of fish. The sounds of these watery ecosystems are becoming a very important tool for researchers like Tim. And he has an idea that might be key to helping these struggling coral reef ecosystems rebound. Armed with a microphone and an underwater speaker, can the power of audio help save coral reefs? From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild.
where are you right now? I'm in the UK at the moment, um, a place called Lancaster. Lanca- it's my neck of the woods, mate. Yeah, oh, I, was, I was born and raised till I was 13 in, in Lancashire. Oh, and nice. Any chance I get to interview a Brit is always a, a, a treat for me, you know. <laughs> it's like nostalgic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lancaster oh, may be a long way from any oh. coral reef, but Tim has made them and the sounds that come from reefs his passion. In fact, Tim did a whole PhD on the subject, reef bioacoustics. A coral reef is an entire ecosystem of life, with the coral at the heart of it. it it's actually quite closely related to jellyfish, um, you know, and so it's this bit bizarre little invertebrate animal um, that makes a skeleton for itself um, by, by taking calcium carbonate out of the water. These sea creatures, the corals, create this skeleton in shallow water, which ultimately forms a massive limestone structure, a foundation for all this life and then uh, that structure creates a habitat for many other um, fish and turtles and crabs and mollusks and you know all all sorts of other invertebrates and fish and reptiles and mammals you know the way you describe it it's not unalien like is it (laughs) i mean you could you can't make this stuff up, can you? It's I mean, bizarre. Like, it sounds it, like it, something from a different planet. It really is. And there are times when, yeah, you, you, you see something or you experience something on a coral reef and, and you think, yeah, that is just out of this world. Just have no idea something like that could exist on the same planet as us. And that's that's one of the reasons why I love working in these ecosystems because they, they really have a diversity and an ability to astonish you every time you go underwater. Coral reefs only cover a tiny amount of the ocean floor, less than 1% of it. But scientists have calculated that more than a million species of plants and animals are associated with coral reef ecosystems. But it's not just their beauty and biodiversity. These underwater gardens provide direct benefits to the people that live close to them. Coral reefs most often grow along the edge of the coast in tropical countries. Places where the danger of cyclones and hurricanes sweeping off the sea onto land is very real. Coral reefs help prevent that by providing a natural breakwater that protects these communities in coastal villages from big storms. Reefs are also a major economic engine for these communities, providing food and, of course, ecotourism jobs. More than half a billion people depend on reefs for food, income and protection. And I think that they have value for some of the poorest people in the world. Uh, I think the people who rely on reefs often have nothing else on which they can rely. They're often trapped on very small islands in the middle of the ocean. And if they lose their reef, they will quite literally lose everything. They will become environmental refugees. Uh, and so I think there's a, a real balance of, of beauty on one, ha- on the one side and necessity on the other side. And, and those two factors, for me, are, are the most compelling reasons possible to protect these ecosystems. So part of Tim's work is to look at new ways to help these important ecosystems not just survive, but thrive. He believes we need to open our ears and listen to them. That's how we'll get the answers. I think it's one of the um, most sort of mis- misunderstood things about the sea uh, it, it is this idea that it's silent down there, you know, and that, that the quiet world beneath the waves, the um, the world of silence, you, you know, and, and it actually couldn't be further from the truth. Just like birds calling from the treetops, the fish below water in the coral reef make their presence heard. But when we actually take equipment down or or even go down and and just be very careful to be silent ourselves and hold our breath and listen then we discover this whole new aspect to the coral reef which is its acoustic side and actually the, the coral reef is the noisiest ecosystem in the sea it surprises me to hear tim describe the coral reef as noisy Apparently, it's a diverse and multi-layered tapestry of sound that's found in the reef. He tells me about 10,000 fish species are making noises. In one month alone, 30 new sounds were discovered in the Mediterranean Sea. He tells me one common sound in tropical areas is like the backing track of a coral reef. It's the snapping shrimp. 
put your head underwater anywhere in the tropics, any time of day, any time of year, you'll just hear this, this crackling sound, and that's the snapping shrimp. And then when you listen more, more carefully, punctuated through that backing track, you'll start to hear the sounds of fish. I always think this almost sounds like a bird. I, I think if we played this to people and they didn't know it was a fish, it would take them a long time to guess this was a fish making this <laughs> yeah, noise. What, and it's, it's a it? tiny little yellow damselfish. It's called the Ambon damselfish. The male Ambon damselfish is very territorial, especially around breeding season. They get very aggressive and chase away other fish. If he gets too close, sometimes they've even tried to scare off Tim as he's diving. So you'll be swimming along and you'll inadvertently stray into one of these fish's territory and then this tiny little yellow fish will be, you know, swimming towards you and coming at you and, and, and then you'll hear this noise as well, this sort of whoop, 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 whoop. Then it's, it's, it's sort of, yeah, the, the Ambon damselfish trying to keep its territory. But a lot of the sounds Tim records remain a mystery so far, times when he's not yet identified which fish species the sound is coming from. This one we joke that it, it sounds a little bit like a chuckle or, or like a, a you know a, an old man sat in the corner of a pub having a bit of a grumble to himself you know sort of <laughs> <laughs> so that that croak sound is is one that we hear quite a lot because we're this is such a new science and we're really just starting to grasp an understanding of the sounds of, of coral reefs then we're not actually sure exactly what fish are making the sounds. Uh, so that's hmm. an example of one of those. There's a wide variety of sounds that fish make, from high-pitched whooping sounds to super deep guttural noises. Tim says that's because each fish has its own unique way of making their particular call. So some of them are making the sounds sort of with, with apparatus around their jaw and, and in their, their throat, I guess. Others of them are banging their teeth together, you know, to create some of the popping sounds. Some fish don't use their mouth or throat at all, but make a sound that instead use their guts or bellies. Fish have what's known as a swim bladder that they can fill with air to control their buoyancy. Some of them can tense the muscles that are around the swim bladder and that whacks against the bag of air and they literally start playing that swim bladder like a drum. Tim can get a little obsessed when he comes across a new fish sound that he can't identify. It's exciting for him, a reminder about how much we don't know about these underwater worlds and the audio science that's evolving around them. One that he's been enjoying and trying to figure out recently, he's calling the foghorn. I hear on reefs at sunset mainly, in the late afternoon hmm. and at sunset, whatever fish makes this noise seems to become active. Whatever this fish is, it doesn't call on its own. It always calls out with other fish. I hear this sound in one area of the reef. And then, you, you know, you'll turn your head and then behind you another one. And, and then they'll all set each other off. All, all around the reef. And I was so curious to find, try and find out what the fish was making these sounds that I, I got an underwater loudspeaker and downloaded the sound of this fish that I'd recorded onto the speaker and, and swam around playing it, trying to get a response. Doing this, Tim managed to get some of the foghorn-sounding fish to call back to him, but he could never work out exactly where the responses were coming from. Just another mystery of the reef. That for me is part of the fun of working in this area, that the, the edge of the unknown is so close, you know, there's still so much yet to be discovered. The edge of the unknown is so close. As well as narrowing in on the sounds of individual species underwater, listening to the acoustic layers of this sonic landscape has started to give researchers a clear picture of what a healthy coral reef ecosystem sounds like. And do different reefs sound different? Like, like if you've got a healthy one versus a, an unhealthy one, I assume it's a pretty different soundscape. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, because the sound of a reef is essentially just a function of the animals that are living on that reef, reefs in different places will sound different, reefs at different times will sound different, and reefs in different states of health will sound very different. So one of the saddest recordings I've ever taken uh, was taken just after the Great Barrier Reef had suffered a whole load of degradation.
This is a recording of an unhealthy reef. It may be hard for the untrained ear to hear the difference, but you can tell there isn't as much life present. Let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's the healthy reef again. And now, an unhealthy reef. It really is like a biological symphony being silenced, as Tim says. But now, he has a bold new idea that might just help these reefs sing once more. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Tim did his doctoral dissertation work out on the Great Barrier Reef of Australia at a place called Lizard Island. It's a remote little island with a research station and a boat. Everything you need to study coral. D yeah, d laboratories and aquariums and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so coral, we went coral Reef Central kind of thing. Ex exactly, exactly. If it, I, I feel funny when I talk to my friends about it because nobody's ever heard of this island unless you work <laughs> on coral reefs, in which case it's pretty much the centre of the world. <laughs> 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 One of those funny places. Tim was there to record the sound of the reef using underwater microphones. Some of his colleagues had made recordings in the same spot a few years before. But something was off this time. I saw this massive difference in the reef sound, uh, and I thought, oh, crumbs, I've botched up the recording. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can barely hear a thing here. Um, so something's wrong. This reef should be really loud. I know that because I've got all the recordings that have been taken on it in previous years. At the time, Tim was the junior scientist of the group and thought he must have set up the equipment wrong. And, and then I sat down with, with my boss and we realised, like, no, actually, the, the equipment's working fine and, and you deployed it absolutely right. Uh, it's the reef that isn't noisy. Uh, that's what's changed. The reef had experienced what's known as coral bleaching. That's when those bright, colourful corals lose their colour and turn white. It's caused by a microscopic algae called zooxanthellae. These algae live inside the coral, providing food for the coral in the form of carbohydrates. But if the water gets too warm, the coral stresses out and expels the algae. As the algae leaves, the coral fades until it looks like it's been bleached white. At which point, the coral's dead and the reef is fast on its way to becoming lifeless. You know, it's like burning down an art gallery or something when, when you lose those. That there's something completely irreplaceable ab about losing an ecosystem that is as, as beautiful and unique as a coral reef. How did you react when you first heard the difference between a healthy and an, an unhealthy reef for the first time? It was a pretty depressing study to do, that one. Um, it's not the sort of discovery that you you dream of growing up as a kid wanting to be a, a scientist you know an environmental scientist and go and discover all these amazing things about the natural world you, you don't want to be the one to discover that it's being trashed wow um yes that must that must have been impactful did it kind of did it fuel you yeah i, I think there's a um th there's a sense that that record, recording damage like that um, and documenting damage like that is, uh, it can be quite difficult at times. Um, uh, it can be quite motivating at times. Um, but yeah, it, it, certainly it's, uh, it's not an emotionally neutral thing to do. Bleaching is the greatest threat to the world's reefs. And the bleaching means the coral reefs lose more than just their colour. One big knock-on effect of this degradation is that the ecosystem loses health and fish leave. With fewer fish, there's less diversity, fewer species to depend upon each other, which leads to even more degradation. It becomes a vicious cycle. 
Sound plays a very important role in where fish live in coral reefs. When a young fish is born, it will immediately be swept out to the deep blue sea by the current, and it spends the first few weeks of life out there. Because there's almost nothing out there that can eat them. You know, if they stay on the reef, they just get eaten by something when they're that small. And so they grow up and develop out in the open sea. Leaving the coral reef as tiny hatchlings increases their odds of survival. Then, once they've reached the juvenile stage, these fish make the journey back to the reef and settle. By this time, they've grown a bit and they're a less easy target for predators in the coral reef. This homecoming back to the reef is really important because the reef needs those fish to arrive because they're the next generation. And so on this sort of odyssey through the open sea, uh, one of the ways in which fish find their way back home is by listening. And that's because these reefs are noisy places. Uh, The sound travels really well underwater. And so from a distance away, these fish are able to detect where the reefs are, even make judgments about the habitat quality of those reefs, decide which one they want to go to, uh, and then home in, you know, homing by hearing, we sometimes call it, (laughs) you know, and they're they're listening in for the sound of the reef, swimming towards it and then settling down there. This homing by hearing The fact that the fish are actually listening out for healthy coral reefs got Tim thinking. All over the world right now, there are efforts to rebuild reefs, where human-made structures are placed underwater, along with coral that's grown artificially in nurseries. Tim wondered if there was potential for sound to be used as part of this rebuilding effort. In an area where you were rebuilding coral and where you were restoring the habitat, if you could advertise that restored habitat using sound, if you could play the sound of a healthy reef as well, might you get more fish coming back? It's an idea that's been deployed before with seabirds, where ecologists placed seabird dummies on restored cliffside habitat and then played the sound of seabirds to attract more seabirds. It's a bit like people being attracted to the nice busy pub with atmosphere versus the one with no one in it. Um, And and so it's the same sort of idea. We're just trying to take it underwater. So Tim spent a couple of months living in that small research station on Lizard Island to set up and test if the sounds of a healthy reef could be used to attract fish in. He set up some experimental reefs and little artificial patches of habitat and put in a DIY underwater speaker system. You know, uh, underwater disco type setup. Uh, we're actually using the <laughs> the loudspeakers that they use in swimming pools for synchronized swimmers, so that they can hear no the way. music underwater. It was those loudspeakers wired into a, a motorcycle battery, which was all housed within a, a sort of canoeing kayaking barrel um, that was then anchored to the seabed. And we used that system to to play the sound of a healthy reef on these habitat patches. <laughs> Every day, for a month and a half, Tim took his small research boat out to each of the areas of reef to monitor the fish. Most fish arrive overnight, so early each morning, Tim would do the rounds, documenting all the fish he saw. You know, five new fish on this reef and count them up and, you know, then go to the next one. And then at the end of the experiment, um, we, we, you know, deconstructed the whole thing, put everything back where it was. At the locations where Tim played the sounds of a healthy reef, twice as many fish came back compared to areas that didn't have any sounds being played. And so it really works like this sort of advertising beacon, you know, sort of roll up, roll up, nice place to live here, and and in they all come. (laughs) Okay, it begs the question then, so you've got this, uh, you've got a coral reef and you are are pulling in the fish to this coral reef that, that is not blossoming and healthy, it's not in its healthiest state, right? When the fish arrive because you've attracted them with those sounds, don't they just leave when they find out that they've been duped? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And there's some more important things in here. So firstly, to our surprise, they don't. They stay. Being a small fish in a reef like this is dangerous. There are a lot of predators. Anything that can eat you will, if it can find you. So moving from place to place makes you easier to spot and very vulnerable. And so Mm. these fish arrive in the dead of night, they find somewhere to live on the reef and then they just settle and they hide away and they stay really close to the reef and where they can where they can hide and and they don't go adventuring around other places. And so there's there's a there's a very real sense in which once a fish has decided where its its home is, that's where its home is. 
And this is key, because if Tim's audio experiment continues as a tool for helping restore reefs, it has to go hand in hand with active rebuilding of reefs too. His underwater speaker systems will have to be combined with attempts to regrow coral and other work on ecosystem rehabilitation. Because just attracting fish to an area that's, you know, degraded and rubbish, that's not a solution. You're just pulling in fish to an area that's still degraded and rubbish. What this is better for is when you're restoring a habitat and you need the fish populations to then replenish, it can accelerate that replenishment. In the world of conservation work, new ideas or studies like Tim are suggested all the time. The ones that actually work and are beneficial are taken up and then used around the world. The ones that don't work or are too much effort or money don't. Tim says it's still too early to tell which camp his underwater speaker system will fall into, but he is hopeful it can be a successful part of the solution. That although the rates of damage on coral reefs around the world are completely unprecedented, are, are very fast, um, there are still reefs that, for various reasons, are hanging on. And, and there are still reefs that have demonstrated in the past an astonishing ability to bounce back. And there are projects that have successfully built back areas of coral reefs that were dying. Tim says this all gives him reason to keep fighting in the face of climate change and warming oceans. But he also believes his recordings can be used for more than just coral reef management. He hopes they will motivate people. We think these sounds are actually very emotionally powerful uh, in some contexts. And, and actually we found that people really can, can engage with the plight of coral reefs worldwide. Uh, people can be quite moved by the, the changing sound of an ecosystem. Tim thinks about how the sound of whales singing grabbed people's attention back in the 80s. Gave the whales a voice and rallied people to the anti-whaling movement. You know, it was used in music, it was used in art. Uh, and I think that there's, I think there's something similar here, that, that we can use the, the sound of a reef as an additional tool to help people emotionally connect with it and, and therefore... Um, act as an advocate for pro-environmental solutions. And Tim Lamont's recordings are doing just that. They're included in a song about the ocean and memories of beautiful reefs by Tahitian artist Vaitiani. The song includes the subtle sounds of the Great Barrier Reef, that backing track, before and after a coral bleaching event. It's a reminder that the power of sound is all around us in the natural world. Sounds we've evolved alongside and been immersed in as humans. Sounds that can be overlooked or forgotten if we don't take the time to just stop and not just listen to them, but learn from them. This song, Hiroa, is part of a multimedia art project called Small Island Big Song. It's a grassroots musical movement from 16 island nations across the Pacific and Indian Oceans, focusing on environmental and climate awareness and cultural preservation. If you'd like to hear more, check out the link in the show notes. Thanks to Ron Kaddish and Tim Cole for allowing us to use this music. You can also experience more from this episode on our Instagram at The Wild Pod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. 
The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. One way to support this vital work is through my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stallman, and John and Julie Hansen. Our production team includes Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Giannotti, Karen McDermott, Teo Popescu, Darcy Riggins-Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. If you enjoy the wild, please spread the word. We tell these stories to reach and inspire as many people as possible. Thanks so much for listening, and take good care of each other. Thank you.